Welcome to Tech News Briefing. It's Wednesday, June 21st. I'm Julie Chang for The Wall Street Journal, filling in for Zoe Thomas. As more electric vehicles hit the roads in the U.S., some question if America's infrastructure is ready for an EV takeover. WSJ tech columnist Christopher Mims says, no, it's not. He recently wrote that the adoption of EVs is not only the biggest shift in our energy and transportation systems, but also the biggest shift in consumer electronics since the iPhone. Christopher sat down with Tech News Briefing's Zoe Thomas to talk about this. Here's their conversation. You don't often associate electric cars with other gadgets, so why did you make that connection? If you've been in a modern day EV, you know, the first thing you notice is the big tablet in the center console and EVs just by their nature, they just have a lot more software and computers of a different nature than we're used to. And so some people have called them smartphones on wheels. And of course, they are compatible with our Android phones or our iPhones. But that integration keeps getting deeper. So they are just taking on a lot of the characteristics of consumer electronics. They got to be updated regularly. They gain new capabilities, but they're more complicated. So you recently took one of these smartphones on wheels for a 1,000 mile road trip. I want to talk about what that was like. First, can you tell us what it was like to charge them? For this road trip, I took the longest range production vehicle that you can buy, which is called a Lucid Air Grand Touring. And with the right wheels on it, it gets more than 500 miles range. And there were some places where it was challenging. Finding a hotel that will let you charge overnight is still way harder than it should be. Often you can find chargers, but you're going to have to walk some distance to where you're staying or you might have to pay an exorbitant fee to stay in a garage like I did one night in Boston. So it was a little bit hit or miss. So tell us where this thousand mile road trip went between. So I went from New York to Montreal and back. And as I discovered, which any seasoned EV owner knows, going over mountains, even small ones, is going to have a big effect on your range. I want to ask about that because range is one of the biggest questions that people think about when they're considering buying an EV. How far can you get on one single charge? How realistic are some of these claims that EV makers are making about the range of their cars? When you buy an EV, the first number they show you about the range is the EPA estimated range. It's pretty accurate in a gasoline car. They don't give you the range there, but they'll give you miles per gallon, and most cars hit that target. It's absolutely not the case with EVs. You have to be a pretty conservative driver under optimal conditions to hit that EPA estimated range. It has to do with how it's calculated. A recent study found that most vehicles are at least 12% less than that range, and it can be a lot less if it's cold, if you're going up and down mountains, if you're accelerating a lot more. How realistic is it to find a fast charger in the U.S. right now? Finding fast chargers can be challenging if you're not driving a Tesla, which is one reason that news that Ford and GM have both made deals with Tesla to allow owners of their vehicles to charge in their nationwide fast charger network was such a big deal. That deal essentially doubles the number of fast chargers that the driver of a General Motors or a Ford vehicle has access to. If you don't have that, you got to be on top of it with apps where you can see what chargers are open where, and you know you may have to be flexible in your route. That is going to get better with time. There's a bunch of announcements coming. 7-Eleven is rolling out a bunch of fast chargers. Subway is rolling out a whole new concept where it's like revolves around EVs because, of course, you're going to stop for a half hour. They figure you're going to buy a sandwich. Yeah, you get hungry while you're waiting. You went between the U.S. and Canada. Can you tell us a bit about what the difference was like in terms of having an EV in the different countries? Fortunately, anywhere you go in North America, you know, the chargers are standard. The main difference is that Canada has really invested in building out their charging infrastructure and making it really dense in cities. That's just something you don't see in major American cities. You can drive anywhere in Montreal and there are street chargers just everywhere and they're open. People are polite enough to leave them open. That's it feels like a very Canadian thing. That is great. And we are trying to do that in the U.S. Part of the Build Back Better bill 
is $1.25 billion to build a network of additional fast chargers throughout the U.S. One concern with adding a lot of EVs to the road is the pressure that they're going to put on the U.S. electricity grid. I mean, how are governments thinking about that? So the good news is we have a really great electrical grid in America. It might not seem like it because it feels like we're constantly having power outages and stuff like that, but our grid is specced to handle the maximum load. So that's, you know, Texas, where it's going to be above 100 degrees and places like Dallas-Fort Worth. So there could be a challenge where you might see a lot of EV owners having to charge their vehicles before a big weather event like that comes. But we have lots of capacity in the grid. The challenge is more, how do we make sure that there's enough capacity all the way down to the individual chargers? So that's where we don't have enough infrastructure and this federal money could really help. All right, that's our tech columnist, Christopher Mims. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Zoe. And that is it for today's tech news briefing. For more tech stories, check out our website, wsj.com. I'm Julie Chang for The Wall Street Journal. Thanks for listening.